Hi everyone, I'm so excited to be speaking to you all today about my journey as a youth climate activist. So I am 19 right now and I'm the founder and executive director of Climate Cardinals uh, as well as a student at Stanford University and a youth advisor for the United Nations. Um, here's my clicker. And so here you can see a uh, brief description about who I am and so I today I, I want to go more into what sparked my journey as a youth climate activist. Why did I get involved? Why do I care about climate change? Um, and then hopefully share some of the lessons that I've uh, learned over the past few years and share them with you all so that you all can hopefully have the same journey that I have. So why did I become a climate activist? For me, it started when I was just 12 years old. I took a two-month trip to Iran, which is my parents' home country. Both of them are from there. So I went with my sister and my mom. And so we went and stayed in my grandmother's house. And so one of the first things that I noticed when I went to Iran was I was struck by how horrible the air pollution was. And I'm, I mean, I live right outside of Washington, D.C., so I'm no stranger to city air, but this was entirely different from anything I had ever experienced before. And you can see this headline from just a few years ago. Thousands of people are being hospitalized in Iran over short durations of time because the air pollution is so bad. Uh, and so this was right after I'd had my first class about climate change in school. It was like my sixth grade class and I learned about climate change. Um, and so one of the things that I learned was that climate change is actually exacerbating air pollution and it's making it worse. Uh, and so I decided to read more about climate change in Iran in the Middle East. And I learned that temperatures in the Middle East were rising more than twice the global average. And so I was basically horrified to learn that my relatives, uh, people I really cared about, like my grandmother, my aunts and uncles, were suffering on the lines of a climate crisis in the Middle East. And I decided to confront them. I decided to talk to my relatives about this issue. And I was shocked because they explained to me that they knew pretty much nothing about climate change. When I was using terms like global warming and carbon dioxide, they looked at me with blank stares and they didn't know what I was talking about. And for me, this was very alarming because it showed that I, as a 12-year-old, knew more than the adults that I looked to for advice uh, on this particular issue of climate change. And I decided to continue to dig around the internet. I looked into what could be causing this, and I learned that part of it was because there was a lack of climate resources available in Farsi, which is Iran's native language. And I actually found a study that read that only 5% of Iranian students could properly explain the greenhouse gas effect, meaning that there was just a lack lack of climate resources and education available in Farsi for Iranians to access. And so I decided to tackle this issue. I didn't want to just sit around and, and be complacent. And so I decided to work with my mom to translate climate resources into Farsi so that I could teach my relatives about climate change. And so when this happened, I, I saw how alarmed my relatives grew. I saw how they started to care about climate change. They were worried for their country. They were worried for their home and for their friends. And they even started to make personal lifestyle decisions to kind of become more sustainable because they cared so much. And that was very inspiring for me because it showed the impact that education and advocacy was able to have on a small level. And so going into high school, I knew that I wanted to continue to make a difference and I wanted to continue to do more. And so what I did is I decided to get involved with a variety of different nonprofits and movements and organizations uh, within my community and then on a national and international level. And so one of the first organizations that I began to work with was This Is Zero Hour. And so what made Zero Hour unique and why I was particularly enthused by their mission is because uh, they believe that they their whole movement needs to be led primarily by young women of color. And this is because they think that people who are being disproportionately impacted by the climate crisis need to be the ones who are coming up with the solutions. And so I say that because people of color are actually disproportionately impacted by climate change through issues such as environmental racism, and then women are also disproportionately impacted by climate change. And actually the UN found that around 80% of the people that are displaced by climate change are women, and part of this is because of economic injustice and uh, the wealth gap 
And so I worked with Zero Hour on a number of different initiatives. I worked to coordinate campaigns with hundreds of nonprofits across the U.S. on issues such as voter advocacy and turning out the vote for climate change and for legislation such as the Green New Deal. Um, and then in addition to that, I started to work with Fridays for Future. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with Greta Thunberg. So this is the movement that she started where every single Friday she would skip school and she would strike. And so I did that, but then sometimes instead of skipping school, I would do a strike during my lunch period or I would strike virtually. Um, and so I thought that Fridays for Future was amazing because it was completely led by young people and they were able to galvanize millions and millions of people to turn out into the streets to strike. And then the last group that I worked with was Extinction Rebellion. Extinction Rebellion, what makes them unique is that they believe that in order to truly uh, turn up the needle on climate action that we need uh, civil disobedience, nonviolent civil disobedience. And so I'm sure you all are familiar with the civil rights movement, the women's suffrage movement, and what really characterized these movements, how we were able to get civil rights uh, and to get voting rights for women is that they used nonviolent civil disobedience. They turned out into the streets, streets they had marches, they had protests, um, and so Extinction Rebellion thinks, believes that we need to do the exact same thing when it comes to climate change in order to get people to truly care. Uh, and so one of the pivotal moments for me was in 2019, I was 17 at the time, I participated in a hunger strike with Extinction Rebellion. Uh, so I skipped school and I went to Capitol Hill and I staged a hunger strike with a number of different uh, protesters in Nancy Pelosi's office and that was my first time ever really being thrust into into the public eye. Uh, outlets like the Washington Post and The Guardian covered our story and we were able to raise a lot of advocacy and awareness. And why I bring up that example is because I think it's so important for young people to realize that you need to do what you think is right. And so I, I got a lot of flack for the protest. I remember returning back to school and people thought I had just used an excuse to skip my econ quiz, but I knew that I was truly supporting a cause that I really believed in. And I know that we had put pressure on those politicians by, by standing in their offices and putting our bodies on the line, by truly demonstrating we cared about climate change because the reality was that without taking actions like that, without taking deliberate steps to show the public how important climate change is, people aren't going to care. And in, in, in fact, six years ago, around 40% of adults in the world had never heard about climate change. And so while we now take as a fact, we take it for granted that so many people talk about climate change and care about it, that wasn't the case a few years ago. And even today, there are so many people who still don't believe in climate change. And that's why it's so important for us to turn up public enthusiasm to get the news and the media to talk about this issue, to talk to our parents and to get people to get involved. And so one of the biggest impacts that the youth movement was able to have was in 2019, in September, we were able to draw over 4 million people to go out into the streets and strike. And this was a very pivotal moment because just a few years prior, um, these uh, adult uh, organizations and adult groups had worked to organize different climate strikes, but in all of these cases, they only were able to draw a couple thousand people, a couple hundred thousand people, which is still a remarkable achievement. But you can see that as soon as young people came, became involved, but not only became involved, but as soon as young people began to lead these protests and to organize these protests, that's when we saw this massive turnout and we saw that it was on the front page of the New York Times people truly genuinely started to talk about climate change and to go out into the streets and protest. And this is specifically because of the power of young people. And we need to realize that we have at our disposal tools that our parents, that our grandparents did it. And that's specifically social media. So through the power of platforms like Instagram and Twitter and even Slack and, and Facebook, we've been able to share the message about climate change, but then get our peers and to get people to go out into the streets and strike because we're able to coordinate on such an international scale, larger scales than ever thought possible before. And so while I was working with these movements, while I was working on strikes, I continued to come back to the same issue that uh, really sparked my enthusiasm for climate action, which was that I noticed that all of these organizations that I worked for, almost all of them, 
only had all of their resources and information available in English, which I thought was a huge issue. Because all I could think of was that we were leaving people like my relatives behind and we weren't engaging as many people as possible in the fight for climate action. Um, and in fact, as I, I continue to do more research, I learned that around 75% of the world doesn't speak English, but about 80% of scientific literature is only available in English. So there's a huge discrepancy between who needs the information and who is actually being able to access it. Uh, and so I decided in my senior year of high school to start my own nonprofit, Climate Cardinals. So Climate Cardinals is an international youth-led nonprofit, and our mission is to make climate education more accessible to people who don't speak English. And we do that by translating climate resources into over 100 different languages. Uh, and so I, I love to tell the story of how Climate Cardinal started because I feel like it demonstrates that honestly anyone, any young person can start a nonprofit and be just as successful as I have because I started with almost no resources. So I would love to see a show of hands of how many of you guys use TikTok. You can be honest. <laughs> okay, a lot of you. And so would you believe me if I said that my nonprofit, honestly, almost my entire climate activism career was started because of one TikTok video that I made with my best friend. Uh, so when on the first day that Climate Cardinals launched, I wanted to uh, post on social media about what we were doing and we had basically no volunteers. It was just me and a couple of my friends and obviously my mom. Um, and so I wanted to get as many volunteers as possible involved in our work. And so I decided to work with my best friend to make this TikTok that she posted to her account, basically inviting young people to volunteer with us for community service hours. So we said that if you translated a climate document for us, you would get community service hours in exchange. Um, and so this TikTok video ended up going viral. On the first day, we got over 100,000 views, over 1,000 people signed up to volunteer with us with an average age of just 16. Um, and even Forbes decided to write about us and to cover our story. So that was a huge moment for me and it demonstrated that even though I, I think that I, I started with almost nothing, it was just like me and my friends, it was an idea I had, a website I had, I was able to turn it into a fully fledged nonprofit just because of the power of social media and because I had an idea that people truly resonated with and it was something that I truly, truly cared about and I was able to work towards. And I think that demonstrates that honestly any, anyone can do what I did. All I did was that I worked towards it. For a year, I worked on coming up with the name for Climate Cardinals, the logo, the idea. Um, and then finally, when we launched, we were able to be enormously successful. And now a year and a half later, we have over 8,000 student volunteers in over 41 countries. We've translated hundreds of thousands of words of climate information into over 100 languages. But all it really started with was my why, my, my big idea, and my passion for making climate education more accessible for my relatives. And so I would love to really use all of this as lessons for you all for if you want to start your own initiative, your own, own idea in your community, what is it that you truly need to think about? And so for me, it all comes back to that one big thing, which is your why. Why do you care about this? Why are you doing your work? And so whenever people ask me this question, everyone always asks, like, why did you become a climate activist? Why do you care about climate change? It always came back to that story I had in Iran where I went there, I saw how horrible climate change was impacting the Middle East and my relatives, and how they didn't have the resources they needed to learn about it. Uh, and so because of that, because I had that strong emotional connection, I was able to devote myself to working on Climate Cardinals. Even when I had hours and hours of homework, I still made time every single day to work on it because it was an issue that I truly, truly cared about. And so I think that if you guys identify your why, and it has to be something you truly believe in, something that you can devote yourself to, then you can come up with a passion project that you, that, that you feel comfortable pursuing and that you want to pursue, and it doesn't feel like a chore, and it doesn't feel like you're just doing something as an extension of school. Um, and so once you have that, I think it's so important to put it to paper, write a mission statement, be able to succinctly explain in one to two sentences what is it you're doing and why. Um, and then also you can make a plan for what is it you need, what are the resources, who can help you, what fundraising do you need. Um, and so for me, like two of the biggest things that I needed was I needed to design a logo, I needed to come up with a name, I needed to create a website so that I could get the word out and so that I had infrastructure to be able to uh, intake our volunteers. 
And then finally, I thought it was so important for me to find a fiscal sponsor. So like I said earlier, I wanted to give community service hours in exchange for the work that young people were doing. Um, and so for that, we needed to have a nonprofit status. And so what you can do if you don't wanna go out and like file all the paperwork, pay for a lawyer, do all that time, um, is you can find a big nonprofit and they can serve as an umbrella organization for your organization and they can basically lend their nonprofit status to you so that you can fundraise tax-free um, and so that you can give out community service hours. So that's what we did. We found a fiscal sponsor and we will, were able to become like an officially recognized nonprofit. And then of course, mobilizing your team, finding people to lean on and to support you. Uh, I, I was able to start with just like a couple of my friends who did some like example translations for me and like two of my best friends who worked as directors for us. And then obviously like the first day we had over a thousand people sign up. So we had to continue to grow. We had to do applications. But I think that all you really need to start is one or two people. That can be your mom, that was my mom for me. That can be your siblings, it can be your best friends. Just get as many people in your community involved and then continue to grow. Um, and so that kind of leads me to where I am now, which I think was inc an incredible growth arc for me. So I started out by in, in middle school, translating climate resources for my relatives. I, and then I went to working with organizations in high school, starting my own organization. And then finally, um, six months after I started Climate Cardinals, the United Nations reached out to me and informed me that I had been nominated for their youth advisory group on climate change to the UN Secretary General, who is the head of the United Nations. Um, and so I, of course, graciously accepted the nomination and I was ultimately selected to represent uh, North America, specifically the United States, on the Youth Advisory Group with these six other amazing young people from all over the world, from India to Sudan. And it's been such an honor and privilege for me, but most importantly, what it's demonstrated is that if the UN on the highest level can implement a youth advisory group and I'm able to sit down and have a conversation with one of the most important people in the world who's able to make time for me and my colleagues and be able to listen to our feedback, it shows that really any organization, any entity, any government has the same facilities to be able to do the same. And so we've been able to talk about our concerns, talk about what we want, from our government with the UN Secretary General and see a lot of that actually tangibly implemented be it through his speeches or through some of the policy measures that the UN is taking. Um, and so I think it's so amazing that you all are gonna have the opportunity to nominate uh, among yourselves, uh, three of you, to be represented on this youth advisory group for the, the Youth Summit because it's an incredible opportunity because truly our generation is going to be disproportionately impacted by climate change if action is not taken. And so it's so critical for us to be in these decision-making tables, to be able to have an input into our futures. And that's the, the input that I've been able to have. And that's the same input that I want other young people to have. Because ultimately we are seven young people out of millions of young people from all over the world. And so we want other young people to have the same input and same influence on decision-making. Um, which leads me to the global youth consultation. One of the things that I have done with the UN is that we held this global youth consultation with young people from over 20 countries. And so they came up with these six key demands that they had for world leaders, which you can see outlined here, um, that they wanted us to share with the UN Secretary General and more broadly share with the public. Um, and so in this report, you can see like some of the big key takeaways was uh, they want investment into green jobs and training. Uh, they want to cease polluter bailouts with public money. Uh, they want to see a just transition to a net zero emissions future. They want indigenous people and local communities to have their rights respected and to be included in climate solutions. There needs to be um, climate education implemented at all levels of curriculum. And then of course, the protection of forests and ecosystems. And so this is by no means an exhaustive list. So I would love for you all to take a, take a moment to look through this. Is there anything that you would add to it? Because this was, this was young people from 20 countries that we surveyed, that we talked to, and we were able to come up with these six key demands. 
but this is by no means exhaustive and I think it's so important for you guys to think that if you had a chance to sit down with decision makers, with politicians, what is it that you would say to them? Because ultimately young people need to be able to have that jurisdiction over policy making processes because you all are, are the ones who have your future at stake. It's our future that's at stake. So don't be afraid to brainstorm and think what is it that I want decision makers to know and then you can tell people like myself who, who actually are able to talk to these people, what is it you want them to know? Uh, and one of the biggest lessons that I've had at the UN is that we need to take people from apathy to action. And so what I mean by that is that I think in part because of the incredible strength of the youth climate movement, we've been able to have more and more people become aware of the climate crisis. We've had more and more millions and millions of people go out into the streets and strike. But ultimately, we need to then move to saying, okay, people care about climate change now, but what are you gonna do about it? What is the next step? And so we want to help people on their journeys to taking the next step. So that whether that means like identifying an issue in your community that you're passionate about, I'm sure many of you have witnessed injustices in your community. You might go out and see plastic pollution in a park, or you might see uh, wastewater seeping into a stream. You can identify an issue and then you can take action. You can think about what you can do about it. And it doesn't even need to be limited to climate change. I think in general, we need more people to not only be climate activists, but to be activists and to feel like they have ownership over these issues in their communities and that you all can do something about it. And I was able to see this issue that I had with my relatives and I was able to turn it into a fully fledged nonprofit. And there's no reason why other young people and other people in general can't do the same and that's really what we need to strive towards as a population. Um, and so I also want to leave you all with these statistics that really demonstrate this is part of the reason why I think it's so critical for young people to be involved in the fight for climate justice and not just be involved but be the ones leading because young people increasingly care about climate change at a rate that is unprecedented. Um, and so you can see two thirds of Gen Zers say that climate change should be a top priority. A third of Gen Zers have actually taken action to address climate change and then another two thirds of teens have talked about the need for climate change on social media or climate action on social media. But even in these statistics, you can see there is a discrepancy because you have two out of three young people talking about the need for climate action on social media, but then only a third of them have actually taken action to address climate change in the last year. And so that goes along with what I was saying earlier about going from apathy to action. And so while it's one thing to care about climate change and to talk about the need for it, it's a whole nother thing to actually implement an idea and to take action on your own. And so that's why even though um, we this is an amazing start, we need to continue to improve on these numbers and to continue to brainstorm. But ultimately we do need to strive for progress, not perfection. And so when, when I tell people people that anyone can be a climate activist. I truly mean that. And you don't need to be a perfect environmentalist. You don't need to um, buy, stop buying clothes and eat completely vegan. Like that's, that's not the point. The point is to make gradual changes in your life, to strive to become a better person and to be better for your community. And ultimately, if you take those steps and other people take those steps, then we'll be better off as a society. So what I'd like to leave you all with is just some ideas of what is it that you can do, and this isn't an exhaustive list, but this is just some things that I've seen have worked and things that I do on my own. Um, and so one of the biggest things that I like to tell people is voting is so critical because ultimately climate change is a systemic issue. When you, when you think about the issue of the climate crisis, you have to realize statistics like 100 companies are responsible for 70% of the world's industrial emissions, which means that if we're not holding corporations, entities responsible for their actions, and if we're not limiting their um, emissions, then we're not gonna be able to make a huge dent where it truly matters. And so, I mean, I'm 19 now. I couldn't vote until a year ago. And so I recognize that many young people can't vote. And so before I could vote, I was talking to my, my parents. I was telling them to make informed decisions about voting for politicians who cared about climate change. And even before that, I was trying to raise awareness for candidates in my community, um, doing voter registration. So I think that there's so many different things you can do, but definitely um, within the US, something I always like to stress is voting. And then obviously supporting 
supporting elected officials that believe in climate justice. And then in addition to that, I think on a school level, there's so much that can be done about passing climate resolutions to pledge to teach about climate change, but then not just teaching about climate change, not just teaching a climate change class, but it's so critical that in classes that already exist to integrate climate change into the curriculum. So in an econ class, for example, it's, it's important to teach about like the impact that um, investing in clean energy would have on the economy. Um, or even talking about climate change and racial justice classes and talking about environmental racism. Uh, so that's a huge thing that I love to stress because people can say like, oh, our, our school teaches about climate change, but is one class really enough? And does that fully encapsulate the intersectionality of the climate crisis? Um, and then as a, you can also do your best to be a conscious consumer. So like I was saying before, strive for progress, not perfection. So for me, uh, like I try to eat as vegetarian as possible. I'm not going to pretend like I don't eat meat once in a while. But for me, it's, it's all about just like limiting my meat and dairy. No, uh, just recognizing statistics like uh, meat and dairy production is responsible for about 15% of emissions. Uh, and then also thrifting. Thrifting is trendy and cool now, but it's also really Really important because the fast fashion industry is detrimental to our planet and so I try to buy as many of my clothes secondhand as possible from apps like Depop, Mercari, Poshmark um, and there are so many actions you can take as an individual to limit your own carbon footprint. And then lastly, I think that volunteering with local climate organizations, creating your own climate organizations, all of these are just part of a broader effort to educate the general public, but then also to educate yourself about what is it that you can do to make a change in your community. There's so much that you all can do. I think it's really just about realizing your own potential, believing in yourself, and then putting uh, your words into actions. The, some of the smallest actions that you can take can truly make the biggest differences. When I first started, I started by cold DMing climate activists on Instagram and asking them how I could work with them, how I could get involved in their organizations and in their, in their nonprofits. I sent so many emails, emails that went unanswered, but the one email that was answers answered was like an opportunity to intern with an organization to work with a different uh, with a local nonprofit in my area and so I think that if you put yourself out there and you truly devote yourself to this that you'll see the results will speak for themselves um, in just a few years I've, I've gone from just working with my mom to translate climate resources to now I'm working to advise the United Nations I'm attending Stanford my dream school and I think that there's no reason why that other young people like yourselves can't do the same thing and so I'll leave you all with that, but thank you so much for having me and I'm so excited to see the solutions that you all come up with.